Hello and welcome back to College Clinton and today's class so on supply and demand. So in our previous couple of lectures we've looked at the theory behind supply and demand and today we're just going to answer questions basically like <laughs> all of them. Uh, I really encourage you to do the questions with me. I really think that's how you're going to get the most uh, benefit from this class. So while you're at the computer pull out a pen and paper. I really encourage you to do it by hand because when you do your exams they'll be done by hand. So we're going to be drawing supply and demand graphs and then writing an explanation about the supply and demand graph, what we're seeing. Um, just like you will do in your exams, okay? So this is just, even as we start, we're preparing for exams later on. Uh, if you don't draw the graphs, actually start drawing them and you just nod your head and as you watch the slides, it, you're just not going to get the full benefit. And when it comes to an exam, when you get a difficult question perhaps, and you're forced to actually draw the graph, actually write the explanation, it's going to be much harder. So I really encourage you from the beginning to get in the habit of actually drawing the graphs. It doesn't need to be like a super technical graph, just quickly draw a supply and demand graph, show the arrows, uh, and write the explanation real quick. Okay, let's, let's start. So for question one, we're going to explain each of the following statements using supply and demand diagrams. So our first situation, when a cyclone hits Queensland, the price of bananas rises in supermarkets throughout the country. So, for those of you who aren't from Australia, Queensland is where is a tropical state of Australia is where we grow all of our most of our I think all of our bananas, and it, it is cyclone prone. And when you when a cyclone does come through, this is what happens to our poor banana trees. So, can we use a supply and demand diagram to show the impact of a cyclone on the supply and demand of bananas? Yes, we can. So, I've got our uh, typical supply and demand diagram here: price, quantity, and we've got. Our demand, our demand curve and our original supply curve. Now we have a cyclone that comes through. What does that do? The cyclone damages the banana harvest, reducing the supply of bananas. So we have a shift to the left. We have a new supply curve here, S2. What does that mean? Well, we intersect the demand curve at a new equilibrium. So demand hasn't changed, but supply has. And now we intersect demand at a new equilibrium. This equilibrium is at a higher price. Makes sense. We've had a huge cyclone. Uh, bananas are harder to get and this means at a new quantity as well we've got a higher price people are you know less willing to purchase bananas at that price so quantity goes down as well so price up quantity down and our, our little explanation our succinct explanation the cyclone damages the banana harvest reducing the supply of bananas this is shown as a shift to the left in the supply curve for bananas the new equilibrium price is higher than the old equilibrium price and supply is also lower so we're just wanting to cover these bases the shift in the equilibrium change in the price and the change in quantity when we answer our questions. All right, the next question, question two. On Tuesdays, picture theaters discount tickets. Now, this is a sneaky question, okay? Uh, so I want you to think about the supply of, um, uh, of tickets at a movie theater, uh, at a movie theater business, and think about how many, we're not thinking about each different movie, we're just thinking about the total number of seats that they have. So the total number of tickets that they can they can sell, okay? And I'm try and actually draw that on a supply and demand diagram and see what you get because I'll show you how to do it, what it, what it really looks like, but it's it's quite interesting. So what's going on here? Well, we have a vertical supply line, and because that's because this number of seats at the movie theater is fixed, you can't increase them, you can't really reduce them, at least not in the short term, not in a hurry. So the supply line for when we have this fixed supply is naturally vertical. It doesn't really matter what the price is. We can't change supply dynamically, right? So a bit of explanation here for movie tickets on Tuesdays. A good has different characteristics and the environment in which it is consumed is one of those. An umbrella on a rainy day is very different than an umbrella on an overcast day, okay? So we, we intuitively, you probably understand that. You think you're probably willing to pay more for an umbrella you know when you're when you rapidly when you really desperately need one because it's raining you duck into like a service station or you duck into a shop to try and buy an umbrella you're probably willing to pay like way more than you normally would be for an umbrella a movie and the same the same for movie tickets so a movie on a friday or saturday night is a different good than a movie on a monday or tuesday night many consumers regard mondays and tuesdays as relatively slow days for leisure and so tend not to go to restaurants or movie theaters as such since the movie theater has a fixed supply, the reduced demand on Tuesdays induces them to lower the price. So, 
think about these is this is our market for movie tickets on a Tuesday, but Tuesday movie tickets supply is fixed. But on Tuesday, well, you know, it's kind of the no one's really going out for a movie ticket to see a movie you know, work the next day. They don't want to stay out late. It's not a great day for leisure, as we described. So we have our demand shift to the left. We have a new second demand curve showing tickets on Tuesday versus, I suppose, tickets on a normal day. So we shift down left on the demand curve, and then we supply curve is the same. So what do we, we what do we see? Quantity remains the same. We just have a lower price. Okay, so lower price, same quantity. Now you can look into a movie theater business, and it's actually much more complex than that. We've got we actually can ramp in some respects. We can ramp up and down supply because we can you know close picture rooms, for example, and we, that means we don't have to put up as many employ as many staff. If you're the picture theater. So things are actually much more complex and even for a movie theater than this simple diagram uh, can show. And I, I remember when I got this question, I actually brought that up. But while I was correct in bringing that up, when we just simply look at the movie, the hold everything else equal and we just look at movie tickets, we're not warrant, we're not, we're really, really simplifying things. Really getting down to just the quantity of seats available, quantity of tickets they can sell versus the demand and versus demand. We can see that this diagram is correct, and you can see it in real life. There is a reason why Tuesdays are cheap for movies, okay? Pretty much worldwide, I imagine. Um, and that's you know because of the forces we just outlined here. And when we show a diagram that shows these forces, this diagram is correct, okay? So even when we start in reality, I suppose, in real life, adding extra variables and making things more complex, uh, oops. Um, this is still, uh, this is still quite relevant. Okay. All right. Moving on to question three, when a war breaks out in the middle East, the price of petrol rises and the price of a used Ford Falcon falls. So we've done the middle East war, uh, question before in our previous lectures. So let's add to it the price of a used Ford Falcon. So if you're not from Australia, you're probably not aware of what a Ford Falcon is. A Ford Falcon is a big car. It's like a tr if you're in America, think about like your trucks, right? A big car that guzzles petrol, guzzle, gas guzzler, right? So what happens when a war breaks out in the Middle East and the price of petrol rises and the price of a used Ford Falcon falls? What, what's going on here? What, why is this happening? So let's have a look at the market for petrol first. Well, obviously a war breaking out in the Middle East is probably going to have a detrimental effect on supply. So we can show that shifting to the left. And that means we've got a higher price and a lower quantity. So that's quite simple. So what about Ford Falcons? Well, obviously a Ford Falcon is a gas guzzler. Uh, gas is a complimentary good for a gas guzzling car. So the price of a gas guzzler rises, well, sorry, the price of gas rises, The you know, what is our demand for a gas guzzler gonna naturally do? Well, it suddenly, suddenly becomes more expensive to run that car, to run a Ford Falcon. So we get a shift left with, there's less demand at any price for the Ford Falcon. But why does supply increase? Well, we've got a new supply line here. Well, if you're running your car, if you think about it, it's a used Ford Falcon. If we go back, the price of a used Ford Falcon falls. So think about the supply of Ford Falcons. If you've owned a Ford Falcon and all of a sudden it becomes more expensive for you to run that car, right? You're much more likely to sell it. You're more inclined to sell that car and buy another one. So if we're looking at the market for Ford Falcons, we're seeing both the reduction in the demand and an increase in the supply. So we're seeing two changes: one in the demand, one in the uh, demand, the demand curve, and one in the supply curve. We've got less demand and more quantity. So we can show this, and in our example, quantity stays the same because these changes in supply, these the, the change in supply counteracts the change in demand. But you don't have to show that. This is just a nice and simple explanation. As long as the, the equilibrium quantity could also change, it just depends on which is more powerful. Which movement, whether the change in demand is more powerful than the change in supply. So even though in, in this example, even though demand is reduced at any price, we've just increased the supply. So we're, we're equi our equilibrium remains at, here at Q1, even just at a much lower price. So just if reading out the explanation we've got here to make it nice and succinct. When a, with a high price of petrol, the cost of operating a big car like a Ford Falcon will increase. As a result, the demand for used Ford Falcons will decline as people in the market for, for cars won't find Falcons as attractive. In addition, some people who already own Falcons will try and sell them. As a result, the supply of used Ford Falcons will also rise. The result is a decline in the equilibrium price of used Falcons. The equilibrium quantity may rise or fall. The fall in demand puts downward pressure on sales, but the rise in supply puts upward pressure on sales. 
Whether the equilibrium quantity rises or falls depends on the relative price elasticities of demand versus supply. As shown, the equilibrium quantity is unchanged, but if demand were to fall slightly more or rise slightly less, then the equilibrium quantity would fall. So we'll get into the price elasticities in our next class, but for now, we can just intuitively grasp the concept. All right, consider the market for station wagons. For each of the following events listed, identify which of the determinants of demand or supply are affected. Also indicate whether demand or supply is increased or decreased. Okay, question one. People decide to have more children. So, think about a station wagon. They're a big car. Uh, you know, this big. This is a really old classic picture. They're a big car with lots of space. All right, so people decide to have more children. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the demand and supply for station wagons? Well, it makes, it makes sense. If people decide to have more children, a change in tastes, they'll want larger vehicles for hauling their kids around. So the demand for station wagons will increase. Supply won't be defected. The result is a rise in both price and quantity. And we can see here, we've got our first equilibrium, a new demand curve, a shift to the right on the demand curve. And we're seeing exactly that. A high price and a high quantity. All right, question five. A strike by steel workers raises steel prices. So What's, what's what's that got to do with you know station wagons? Well, steel is an input into station wagons. So an increase in the price of steel, because well, we're assuming a, yeah, well, an increase in the rise, uh, price of steel will do, due to a strike, will do what to the market for station wagons? So a strike by steel workers raises steel prices. The costs of producing a station wagon rise because of the rise in the input prices. So the supply of station wagons decreases. Demand won't be defected. The result is a rise in the price of station wagons and a decline in the quantity. And we can see here, we've got our demand curve, same demand curve. We're just shifting left the supply, uh, the supply curve. So we have a new equilibrium, a higher price, less quantity. Makes sense, you know, suddenly station wagons are more expensive. We intersect higher up on this demand curve. Question six, engineers develop new automated machinery for the production of station wagons. So, what is what what does this make? I think we we know this sounds like it should be very much should be ringing bells for you that this is a supply something to do with the supply curve. Engineers develop new automated machinery for the production of station wagons, more efficient, cheaper. So is that going to shift the supply curve left or is it going to shift it right? It's going to shift it right. We're cheaper at any at any price. So the demand of new automated machinery for the production of station wagons is an improvement in technology. The reduction in the firm's costs result to an increase in supply. Demand isn't infect affected. The result is a decline in the price of station wagons and an increase in the quantity. So just shifting, shifting right our supply curve, which means we intersect with the demand curve at a lower price, it means we have a high quantity at a lower price. Question seven, the price of minivans rises. So if we think of minivans, what's a minivan to a compared to a station wagon. Are they a complementary good or are they a, sub, a substitution? They're a substitution because we can either buy a minivan and station wagons that do very similar things. So the rise in the price of minivans affects station wagon demand because minivans are substitutes for station wagons. That is households that might purchase a minivan also consider purchasing a station wagon. The result is an increase in the demand for station wagons. Makes perfect sense. You're competing, you're the competitive, the, com, the competitor to station wagons, the, com, uh, the, the product that is the competitor has got more, more expensive. Well, that's gonna make us more people who are you know, looking for this kind of product to be more likely to purchase a station wagon. So we, our supply curve stays the same. We're shifting the demand curve. And that means we're shifting the demand curve right. We get a higher price at a higher quantity. So. Let's do some theory questions. We're just gonna round out the class with just a bunch of quick theory questions. Does a change in consumers' tastes lead to a movement along the demand curve or a shift in the demand curve? Does a change in price lead to a movement along the demand curve or a shift in the demand curve? So hopefully this should be quite simple for you. So remember we're holding all things else equal. Does a change in customers' tastes lead to a movement along the demand curve or a shift in the demand curve? It's a change in a consumer's taste leads to a shift in the demand curve. Change in price leads to just a movement along the curve, as we've discussed in our previous lectures. Doesn't a, cha a change in producer's technology lead to a movement 
along the supply curve or a shift in the supply curve. Yeah. So again, along the same lines, and hopefully you're getting starting to get the hang of this nice and quickly. Change in producer's technology, it's abstract or it's holding price equal. So that a change in the producer's technology causes a shift, whereas a change in the price is a movement along. Change in the producer's technology leads to a shift in the supply curve. Change in price leads to a movement along the supply curve. All right, define the equilibrium of a market. Describe the forces that move a market towards its equilibrium. So this is a kind of a definitional question, but and we've we've discussed it before, and now we want to put, put it in writing, put it in clear, succinct form. The equilibrium of a market is the point at which the demand and supply curves intersect. Very logical. At the equilibrium price, the quantity of the good that buyers are willing to willing and able to buy exactly balances the quantity that sellers are willing and able to sell. If the price is above the equilibrium price, sellers, sellers want to sell more than buyers want to buy, so there is a surplus. Sellers try to increase their sales by cutting prices. That continues until they reach the equilibrium price. If the price is below the equilibrium price, buy, uh, equilibrium price, buyers want to buy more than sellers want to sell, so there is a shortage. Sellers can raise their price without losing sales. That continues until they reach the equilibrium price. So just remember the forces of supply and demand. We spoke about this in our previous lecture when we talked about surpluses and we talked about shortages and how these, what, what inevitably happens when in that situation. And, there, and eventually we just converge on that equilibrium where these forces are balanced. And so when you're answering this question, just if you're having trouble, just remember at the equilibrium, the quantity at the equilibrium price, the quantity of the goods that buyers are willing to and are willing and able to buy exactly balances the quantity that sellers are willing and able to sell. Everything should go from there because if you under, as we've previously discussed, if you understand shortages and you understand oversupply, you can then quickly pull them all together. Okay, moving on. Cigarette taxes are a way governments attempt to reduce smoking. Now think about the markets for other tobacco products such as cigars and pipe tobacco. Are these goods substitutes or complements for cigarettes? So think about cigarettes and think about tobacco and uh, cigars. So it's about other tobacco products, so cigars and pipe tobacco. So do they, you know, can you smoke a cigarette at the same time as you can smoke a pipe? Well, not really. <laughs> if you, you're likely to do one or the other and you're likely to buy one or the other. They're substitutes, right? Cigars and chewing tobacco are substitutes for cigarettes. Now, we've discussed intuitively, and I just gave the intuitive definition for substitution, but the actual mathematical definition is since a higher price for cigarettes would increase demand for cigars and pipe tobacco. And we, you understand that intuitively, I'm sure you do. If we, if we, if we have cigars and we have tobacco, we have, uh, sorry, chewing tobacco, and we have uh, pipe tobacco, and, we, and the price of cigarettes increases, well, what do you think is going to happen to the demand? But the price of uh, the pipe tobacco and chewing tobacco remains the same. And what's going to happen to demand for those other two substitutes? Well, we know the demand is going to rise. So that's our actual definition of a of a substitute. And the inverse holds true for complements. That's it. We're at the end. That's the end of week two questions. So we covered them pretty quickly, but I really encourage you to, without waiting, without watching the video, be able to answer all those questions on your own. So we, these aren't particularly difficult, these questions, but they're important, you get it right now. So I really encourage you, you, you need to, at the end of week two at university at the, in this course, you need to be able to, you know, these simple questions, you need to be able to draw the demand curve on your own and write an explanation on your own. If you can do that, you're in good stead, okay? And if you can't do that, start doing these questions until you can, very important. So we got a couple of quotes here. I'm like, from one from Al Capone, I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm like any other man. All I do is supply a demand. And that's very true of Al Capone. And our second quote here by David Harvey, the equilibrium between supply and demand is achieved only through a reaction against the upsetting of the equilibrium. Okay. So thank you very much, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, put them in the comments or email me. And uh, yeah, we'll be back uh, for our third uh, lecture coming soon. Okay. Take care, guys. And as usual, good luck out there.